Salutations and welcome, friends, to another episode of Amalfi Sports. I'm your host, Matthew DeSantis, and in this episode, we're taking a break from handicapping horse races to bring you another one of our interview features of prominent individuals across the horse racing industry. Remember, the best way to get all of this content on Amalfi Sports is to subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our website at amalfimedia.com, and in the very near future, we'll be launching a podcast solely dedicated to horse racing called The Win Place Show. So look for that on your podcast platform of choice in the coming days and weeks. Okay, let's move on to the interview. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Acacia Courtney, who is an analyst and host of the very nearly daily horse racing coverage for the New York Racing Association on Fox Sports and Fox Sports 2. Prior to her position at Naira and Fox Sports, Acacia worked in a variety of other media positions in horse racing, including being an on-air analyst, reporter, and assistant producer at Gulfstream Park and Casino. Acacia started her career in the industry by working as a content contributor and analyst for America's Best Racing and the Horse Racing Radio Network. A former graduate of Fordham University, Acacia majored in communications and media studies with a concentration in journalism. And during her time in college, she won the 2014 Miss Connecticut and was a top 15 semifinalist for Miss America. At her roots, though, Acacia is dedicated to horses through her work for the Humane Society and serving as founder and president of Racing for Home, which is a nonprofit dedicated to rescuing and retraining thoroughbred ex racehorses. Acacia and I spent time talking about her initial interests in horse racing, the lessons she learned coming up in the business, how she evaluates horses in the paddock, some of her favorite interview subjects, and a whole lot more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my interview with Acacia. Acacia, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today about your experience and knowledge of the horse racing industry. I wanted to start by talking a little bit about where your introduction to horse racing started. You had mentioned in an interview that you were about nine years old when you had your first in-person experience with horse racing. And I was curious, how did your connection to the sport grow after that? Did you just start wanting to go to the track all the time? Did you want to learn how to ride? Did you learn more about horses? I'm always interested in where people's genesis of their interest in this industry starts. Yeah, it, it's funny. It's a common question because um, I, it, it kind of happened accidentally, to be honest. I started riding when I was about eight, so I was familiar with horses. But yes, my first kind of in-person experience as a, at a racetrack was uh, when I, I grew up in Connecticut. Sorry, my cat making a cameo as well. <laughs> um, I grew up in Connecticut, so we would go to the New England fairs, and um, it was going to fair races, like at the Northampton Fair. And that's where I first remember seeing a, a horse race in person. You know, we would always watch the Kentucky Derby on TV and I was intrigued by the great stories of the great race horses of old but I never really kind of knew anything about it very very much so did I um not plan to work in the horse racing industry. So uh, when I was in high school, my mom and I started getting more involved in retraining x race horses. And it was about that point, I was 17, 18, and we created Racing for Home, which is our, our nonprofit. I started saying, okay, you know, I should really learn where these horses are coming from. And I ended up getting swept up into the industry. Yeah. So when you were in college, uh, you were a communication media studies major. And you'd mentioned that you weren't necessarily interested in, you know, going into the industry as a full-time profession. But I was wondering, as you were going through college, did utilizing and leveraging your degree to work in the horse racing industry, did that become something that was more and more attractive to you? Or were you just kind of interested in going where journalism was going to take you no matter where that might lead? So I actually started out in college as a... Um in the pre-veterinary program because I'd always loved animals. I had grown up dreaming of being a vet and I had actually, at that point again, we had been kind of getting more involved in the world of horse racing 
through aftercare and I had said, okay, maybe I could be a racetrack vet or, or work with horses and be a vet in that aspect. And pretty much everybody that I spoke to said, don't do it. It's, uh-huh. it's not going to be, you know, if you're going to spend all that time to go to school and, um, cover all of, uh, those medicine classes, then just go and be a doctor. Um, it's, it's tough. And I have a yeah. good stomach, you know, as far as injuries or watching surgeries or things like yeah. that. Um, but in the case that you're not able to save an animal, that's, that was something that really didn't, didn't ever work for me or set well for me. Um, and it is obviously a part of the job. And I had gotten advice that being a racetrack vet is, is a very challenging career path. Um, and so I decided to end up switching and I actually took a little bit of time undecided and then I decided to become a journalism major because I was getting more involved in horse racing at the time. So it was kind of, they went hand in hand together. And the communications program at, at Fordham, where I went to school in New York City, was excellent because I had a lot of professors that had worked really hands-on with some big names in the world of sports and news and media. And I learned a lot in that aspect. And actually, my first on-air job was with radio. But then when I started at Gulfstream Park, my boss at Gulfstream said that one thing that made me stand out was that I actually had a journalism degree, that I knew how to write, that I knew how to work a camera, I knew how to edit. And so all of those things really came in handy. As a former political science professor, that warms my heart to hear that story. <laughs> um, I, I wish I could take that little clip and share it with all my former students to <laughs> let them know uh, how important those things are. So uh, that's really great to hear. Uh, as you mentioned, your first job, one of your first jobs was, was the Horse Racing Radio Network. You also worked for a while with America's Best Racing, Gulfstream Park. And I'd imagine you learned something in each of those positions. And I was curious, kind of what are one or two things that maybe surprised you when you first started working in the industry or what were important lessons that you learned during those first few years? Well, I think for me, a big thing was just kind of learning on the fly, to be honest. Um, I I didn't really know a ton about the insides of the industry when I started. And so I was really grateful to the likes of Mike Penna, who um, owns the Horse Racing Radio Network. And he gave me a chance right away when I didn't actually know anybody. And I remember my first job with them was actually at the Kentucky Derby. So it was kind of baptism by fire. (laughs) And I was like on Google images on my phone trying to decipher who was what trainer just because I, I didn't know. You yeah. know. I had seen these people on TV, but I, I hadn't met them before. So yeah. he um, what I learned most at Horse Racing Radio Network was um, just basically how to be a horse racing broadcaster. And Mike sat down with me and kind of taught me how to craft insightful questions and things that would prompt more intriguing answers. And obviously I've taken that and created my own style, but he really helped me lay a foundation. And I'll always be really grateful for that because I was coming into that job used to being interviewed and obviously I had studied communication. So I knew the basics of interviewing people, but not necessarily tying the two together in horse racing. So I think that foundation is probably one of the biggest things that I learned um, in those places along the way. And then I think the other thing that I still struggle with, but try to remember is trusting your gut. You know, I was given this position because I am good at my job and I have to kind of remind myself of that sometimes. It's, you know, you kind of beat yourself up afterwards if you're like, wow, I really liked that horse and I didn't stick with my own intuition. So trusting your your own instinct in these kinds of situations can sometimes really be the, the biggest takeaway. That I wish I would have had that takeaway last weekend when I was at Saratoga because my friend talked yeah. me out with a couple of horses. Uh, and then I was like, I told you there. <laughs> I had a feeling. Um, but uh, I wanted to jump forward to the president and your wonderful coverage of America's Day at the Races on FS1 and FS2, uh, which is currently camped out at Saratoga. Uh, and if you could, for some of our listeners who may have never had the opportunity to go to Saratoga, what makes the track and the area so special? Because it's talked about in such reverence by so many horse racing fans. It is. We all love it, don't we? And the, the great thing about it is that 
every day there's a stake race, but there's also going to be two-year-old races where you see future stars. Even the claiming races are special because people want to win at Saratoga. All the attention is on this track, and it is a boutique meet. It's now eight weeks, so it's a, a short amount of time. So I think that feels like there's an immediacy, like you want to be there, you want to win there, because there's not that much time to succeed at Saratoga. And at the same time, I think one of the things that makes it so special is that it's not just the racetrack, but it's the whole town surrounding it that really follows what's happening at the races. Um, you know, for me, uh, I don't think I've been out to dinner once and we go out almost every night because there's owners and, you know, people to see, especially now with everybody coming back to the racetrack this year. Um, I don't think there's been one night where I haven't seen somebody that I know or a fan come over to say hello or something like that. But that's the nice thing about it. Restaurants are going to have the races on TV. Um, yeah. You know, from my fiance is an assistant trainer, and they had a really exciting two year old that won first out. And the local news came to the barn the next day to talk about it. You know, you're not going to have that yeah. at any other place. No, that, that's that's a great story. Yeah, I love that. And you're right, it's a lovely small town that just lives and breathes horse racing. Um, so, as part of your coverage, you're regularly in the paddock looking at these horses up close and personal. Now, a lot of casual fans will go to their local track, they'll go to the paddock. And they'll go, well, that's a pretty looking horse, you know, and, uh, you know, that kind of is where their analysis ends a lot of times. And I was wondering if you could share maybe some helpful tidbits for beginners to what they should be looking for when they're watching a horse in the paddock in terms of how it looks or how it's acting when interacting with the jockey, the trainer, the handlers, et cetera. Well, one of the biggest things I think for a starting place is does that horse fit the conditions? Mm. So say it's a turf sprint and you have a horse that's giant and you know doesn't particularly look super fast, that horse is probably not going to be suited to sprinting. Um, on the other side of the coin, maybe you're going to see a horse that's really compact and um, really kind of a short back and a stockier type and has a really flat hoof and then you see that this horse is running a mile and an eighth on the dirt. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like they're going to fit. Same thing with two-year-olds. You think, okay, this is a really good looking horse, but this one looks ready right now. Sometimes they're just going to mentally and physically be a little bit further along. Those are the early ones that are going to win first out. It doesn't necessarily mean they're more, more talented. It just means that they're ready now. And with two-year-old races, that's always the biggest thing is who's most prepared, really, at the end of the day. Sometimes talent will overcome it, but it's who's most mentally and physically ready and, and the furthest along. So those are the, the big things. Does that horse fit the conditions. For me, because I cover every day of racing at Saratoga, Maggie Wolfendale and I split the shifts, mm -hmm. but even when we're not on, we're both paying attention. Um, I take really, really, really detailed notes on every horse that I see on my iPad. So for me, if there's a change, that's always going to be a big thing for positive or negative. If it's a surface switch, and I had written last time, I'd like to see this horse try the turf, then that's hopefully a horse that I'm going to get a little bit of a value play on. And that comes into my handicapping as well. Or a horse that I liked going in, and I said, you know what? He really looked a lot better last time than he does today. That's one that I'm going to try to play against in that kind of scenario. Yeah. Now, those are great tidbits and, and hopefully helpful for some of our listeners when they're at the track next time. Um, so one of the big events that just recently took place in Saratoga was the Fasig Tipton uh, Saratoga Sale of Yearlings. And that was something you covered, actually, and talked about on your podcast quite a bit in the ring, uh, which people should absolutely check out. But I wanted to get your thoughts on what were some of the big takeaways from that sale and if there were any yearlings that you were particularly drawn to or surprised by. I mean, obviously, the headlines were the 2.6 and $1.6 million sales, but just curious what your general takeaways were from that sale. I think the biggest takeaway was that the, the market is very strong and people were very keen to get back to the sales this summer. Uh, we didn't get to have the Saratoga sales, either the select sale or the New York bread sale last summer at Saratoga. And I think that um, everybody really missed that, especially just the climate of the Saratoga select sale. And then especially for New York breeders for the New York bread sale and not being able to have that platform to sell. Um, but obviously the Saratoga select sale, there were fireworks as was expected. 
did. The numbers were very strong. Um, and it's diff it's a difficult sale to buy at, but it does mean that there are some exciting ones to see, and you have some monster pedigrees in there as well. Um, one big takeaway I had besides just the prices that we saw were some of the new stallions. It was a big night for Baltioro, actually, one that I had been very intrigued by as to how his yearlings were going to sell. As this was his first crop that we've seen um, going through auction. Sold really well. Um, there was one horse of his, a, a colt that was out of uh, the the family of Rachel Alexandra. Mm -hmm. So that one, I think, sink sold for $1.4 million and uh, was really impressive. But it was a big night for him. It was a big night for Into Mischief, as it always is. He's the hottest sire, definitely in the country. Um, and some of the uh, Europeans who purchased, uh, or people from overseas purchased into mischiefs, I think we're going to see a lot more of his progeny overseas as well because they they run on anything, in my my uh, estimation. So. I thought that was really interesting to see that level of success that he's had carried on through this sale again. Yeah, that's interesting. It was, uh, I also made note, uh, gun runner, I thought also had a big night because he, uh, it, really it, big success with two year olds. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, Cause the previous weekend, his progeny had won, I believe the best pal and the Adirondack. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, geez, that's, he's making some money yep. <laughs> uh, this week. And I, he only had two, I think in the sale, but it was still, they both went for over half a million. So it was, uh, uh, it is, it's fun to kind of follow that to see how their progeny perform uh, and as two-year-olds, three-year-olds, et cetera. Um, so I wanted to go through kind of a couple of quick hitting questions. Uh, you know, pop first thing that pops into your mind, you, you can expand on your answer. You don't just have to stay to one word or anything like that. But um, excluding Saratoga, what is your favorite racetrack? Um, I would say Happy Valley in Hong Kong. Oh. Um, I've had the privilege of going to Hong Kong three times, and there's just there's nothing like that place. Right in the middle of the city, and it really is a party Wednesday nights. That's awesome. That that's a brand new answer for the show. So I love that. Yeah. Uh, what racetrack that you've never been to would you most want to visit? Um, I would love to go to Ascot. I've, I've never been to Royal Ascot. I've actually never been to any racetracks in Europe. Um, uh -huh. Like I said, I've had the privilege of going to Hong Kong, but I would love to go to Royal Ascot or at least to, to see the racetrack. Yeah, that's great. I was, I was at Windsor once, uh, and uh, that was very fun. I won somehow on every single race, and so I don't think I'm ever going to go back again because I just yeah. <laughs> have to leave it on a high note. <laughs> exactly. Can't, can't, you can't ruin my streak. Um, <laughs> So do you prefer dirt races or turf races? I prefer turf races. I think they're fun to handicap. They're fun to watch. I love looking up pedigrees, especially when horses are switching surfaces. So um, every time there's like a distance turf race, I'm, I'm all for it. So based upon your answer to the previous question, I'm interested, how often when you're in the paddock, do you change your mind on a horse based upon what you see versus what you've already researched in the past performance? I mean, is it something that happens daily, every once in a while? I'm just curious how frequently you change your mind. Um, it happens pretty often, actually. I try to go into the paddock with an open mind. Obviously, I've done all the prep work. I've watched the replays. I've looked at my notes from the last time I saw that horse, if that's the case. Um, if workouts are available on XBTV, I'll, I'll try to watch those, especially for maidens or especially for two-year-olds. And then um, if there's pedigree notes that I can look up, then I've done all of that prep work leading into it. So there is kind of a foundation, but I try to keep an open mind and just kind of which horse catches my eye first. I'll focus a little bit more on the betting public's favorite, whether I like that horse or not. But if a horse is going to change my mind, I try to stay very open to that, even if I did like the horse on paper coming in. Gotcha. Good to know. Uh, so you do a lot of interviews for your job. And I was curious if you have a favorite jockey that you enjoy interviewing. Oh, favorite jockey. Um, you know, it's funny, especially being on the New York circuit, I, I've gotten uh, to feel very fondly about all of them, really, because mm -hmm. I, I get to know them all so well. Uh, but I would say just as far as interviewing, um, the Ortiz brothers give such good insight and, and John Velasquez as well. I, I'd say probably those three. And, and obviously, um, they came from the same Puerto Rican jockey school that John Velasquez did. Mm -hmm. But especially um, talking to them after a race, you really 
can learn a lot about the race is listening to those guys. And I think that's the same for every jockey if you ask the right kind of questions. But mm-hmm. usually I found that those three are kind of a little bit more forthcoming immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, if you pick up on something and you ask Johnny about it, he'll go right into this whole story about the horse and what he was feeling and what was happening. And he'll really take you through the race. And it's yeah. it's really, really interesting to listen to and, and to get that feedback. And, you know, somebody like Jose Ortiz, I know many trainers really relied on his insight working horses as far as what the surface may be, the distance and what he feels because really um, a a perceptive rider and and able to articulate that as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. So uh, flip it around a little bit. Do you have a favorite trainer to interview? Uh, well, I'm biased. My, my future father-in-law <laughs> is, is Christoph Kamas. So if I'm interviewing him, that means that, you know, we want to race, which is the most exciting. Of course. Uh, so I, I'm biased with that. But um, just as far as in general, enjoying interviewing, um, I, I'm not sure if I have a favorite, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. Uh, I think that especially here in New York, we're, we're so spoiled and being mm-hmm. able to, to speak to certain trainers, um, and, and owners as well, which is one of the nice things about having people back at Saratoga is getting a chance to, to talk to those owners who sometimes don't get the spotlight as much. But, um, I mean, speaking to a guy like Bill Mott or Todd Pletcher or Chad Brown, you're going to get very intelligent and well-articulated answers as well. Uh, Rudy Rodriguez is always fun because he cracks himself up too. So that's a, you're usually laughing when you're yeah. interviewing Rudy. Yeah, no, I always love Rudy's giving fist bumps to everybody and, and yeah, yeah, he's exactly. having a good time. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, a fun one. What person makes you laugh most off camera or offset from the Fox Sports team? Uh, that's an easy one. It's our director, Mitch Levitis. Uh, he will be in our ear cracking jokes. He's a he it was a comedian as well. So he he's got the uh, to back it up. He's usually like texting me TikTok videos during the show or something. And um, when I'm hosting at Belmont, I sit in the host chair and do that a lot more versus yeah. in Saratoga. I'm just in the paddock. Yeah. Um, so I've got Mitch in my ear all the time. And I'll say it is a really good practice and it makes you better as an on-air host because you've got somebody like telling you gossip or joking or something in your ear while you're trying to talk and be kind of the the pilot of a show. Uh, But he's he's absolutely hysterical. He's a great friend. I've learned a lot from him, but um, he he will absolutely make you crack up. I love that. That's great. Um, So as I mentioned, you can watch Acacia's coverage of the races at Saratoga every Wednesday through Sunday on FS1 or FS2. Uh, And I want to get you out of here on one final question. Uh, We're interviewing this about 10 days before Travers weekend, uh, which is obviously huge in the headlining race, but it is a stacked undercard as well with I think four or five other grade one uh, stakes races that day. And I was curious even though the fields aren't necessarily set, is there a particular race on the undercard that you're most looking forward to during Travers weekend? Hmm. Let's see. Usually I have to say Travers day, there are a lot of spectacular maiden races too. Hmm. Um, so those are ones that I look forward to, um, as far as again, being biased, but it is a race that I love. I mean, I mentioned, I love distance turf races. Yeah. Um, the Quant Stable has Gufo running in the Sword Dancer that day, which is mm-hmm. a mile and a half on, on turf, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love those marathon turf races. Uh, you know, down at Gulfstream, there's the, the likes of the McKnight and the McDermott and the Allen Jerkins, which is two miles on turf. And I just think they're so fun to handicap. So that's a race I always really love um, and obviously have a rooting interest in there. But I think every race on the card that day is going to be spectacular. And I have to say, just it's not quite the undercard. It's not that Saturday. But the day before is New York Bread Showcase Day. And for me, that's always a day I look forward to, having worked in New York. Now, this is my third year full time. I've come to get such an appreciation of the New York Bread program and those tough New York Bread horses. So I really love that Friday, the day before the Travers, they get their day in the spotlight. Yeah, that's great. Well, that gives the fans a lot to look forward to on Travers Weekend. So, Acacia, thank you so much again for your time and sharing your knowledge and experience with the audience. And uh, all the best at Saratoga in the remainder of the season. Thank you so much. It's been going fast, that's for sure. A big thanks again to Acacia for her time and knowledge. Make sure to tune back to Amalfi Sports for more horse racing, handicapping, interviews with figures from across the industry, and so much more. 
Finally, if you want to keep up with daily news of horse racing, follow me at Twitter at the handle at failed to menace or visit us at amalfimedia.com. Until next time, I'm Matthew DeSantis reminding you that it's now post time.